Last week we started our, we're just taking a break from our exposition of study through the scriptures. The next book we're going to be cover on Wednesday night is what? Ezekiel, Ezekiel, that's right. But I thought we would take a break and just do a study on eschatology, just a quick review and understanding from 30,000 feet of what eschatology really is. Wow, a lot of people interested in eschatology. Eschatos. Eschatos is where it comes from, the Greek word eschatos, which means the end, the end of all things, right? So ology, it's the study, it's two Greek words actually, the study of the end. So we're looking at what the Bible has to say about the end of time or the end of the age. It's always a very interesting study. It's amazing how many people come out when you're talking about Bible prophecy or end times because everybody wants to know what the future holds, right? Yeah, what, what's going to happen? Now, as wonderful as a study of eschatology is, uh, anybody ever read the, the book, The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey? Yeah, that got me started on my journey, you know. And uh, I, I really enjoyed his commentary. It's, the book is really just a commentary on the book of the Revelation. But after a little while, I, I couldn't listen to him anymore. Why couldn't I listen to him anymore? Anybody know? He was married and divorced eight times. That, that's a problem, isn't it, dear? I mean, the most precious of all relationships is a marriage relationship, and if I should be showing fidelity or Christ-likeness anywhere, it should be here, right? I mean, Abraham Lincoln did, didn't he? Who was he married to? A, a maniac. If you know anything about Abraham Lincoln's wife, Mary Tyler, she was out of her mind. She was insane. And, and the, the, the way she would abuse that man, but he was so patient, so kind, so long-suffering, so forgiving. Uh, that's what gave him the character that he needed to take our nation through the most difficult time we've ever had as a nation, the Civil War. Hmm? So I just want to emphasize once again, it's wonderful to have this understanding. It's not necessary. What is necessary is that we are Christ-like. What is necessary is that we're allowing the Holy Spirit to work through us in such a way that people see him and not us. The number of failings that are out there in the church, these celebrity pastors and their mega churches, it's nauseating. There's a, comment, there's a documentary, a three-episode documentary that came out on Disney, not Disney. No, Disney, that's another... <laughs> Unbelievable, unbelievable. But, but there's a commentary that came out on uh, Discovery Plus. Anybody have Discovery Plus? And it's a documentary on uh, Hillsong. And it's, it's collapse. And the abuse that had taken place. It's in three episodes. And it's, it's, it's everything I've been telling you. And it's everything that unfortunately is happening in so many of these large mega churches. A jackass can teach the word of God. Hee-haw. <laughs> right? It, listen to me. It takes a person with a heart to allow the love of God to work through them and to truly love God and love one another as we should. Isn't that what's most important? The chief attribute of our God is love. Love. The fruit of the Spirit is and So if we're not really loving one another and displaying fidelity as we should... The woman who wrote the Proverbs 31 book, seminars all over the country. What's happened? You don't know what's happened? She filed for divorce for her husband. He, yeah, he's brokenhearted about it. The Proverbs 31 woman. Oh, my God. You know. So you don't understand what I'm saying to you? Oh, we love, we, listen to me. And I'm not, I'm not pointing my finger at anybody here, but I'm just asking you once again, we need to do a self-examination. Am I more interested in eschatology than Christology? Am I more interested in knowing what end times has to say than the sanctification that the Holy Spirit wants to work in my life? That's what's most important. And, and where's that going to be displayed? Where, first and foremost? In, in the closest relationships you have. Who'd you come with this evening? Who are you going to bed with this evening? You know, who are going to wake up with tomorrow morning? Those are the people that should see the Christ in you more than anybody else. Amen? So, that's why I'm, I'm cautioning you. 
how Lindsay was married and divorced eight times, and after I saw his personal life and what a failure it was, how could I listen to him anymore about what he has to say about the Bible? And isn't that what's happening so often now? Unbelievers don't want to hear what we have to say. What do they tell you when you try to witness into them, right, uh, Austin? The church is full of... Hypocrites. Is it true? Yes. The organized church. Chris in... Dumb. dumb. With the emphasis on the dumb, right? But the body of Christ? Nay, never. The body of Christ is actually allowing Christ to live his life through them, right? So... Please, understand, your grasp of eschatology and this subject isn't monumentally important. It isn't. It's, it's fun. It's interesting. But I'm going to give you a lot more information than you want, and I'm not even going to go anywhere near the depth we could, because it's like peeling the onion here, because there are so many different paths we can take off of all of these different subjects. But the only thing that's really truly important, and it should never divide, and any of our understanding of the lesser Doctrines of the way. Systematic theology. Somebody mentioned to me that, that they mentioned to a group of folks here that you didn't know what systematic theology was. I don't know how many times I've mentioned systematic theology. Have I never mentioned systematic theology? I don't know how many times I've mentioned systematic theology. What's a systematic theology, Glenn? It's how we approach the scriptures. It's how we approach the scriptures. And it's... It's like we go at it one book, book, one, one. Right. Right? Now, that's, that's, that's our expositional study of the word. Because we take the word literally as dispensationalists. We let the word speak for itself. We let what comes out of the text. We don't try to put anything into the text. We want to understand what is coming out of the text, right? But a systematic theology is all of the major subjects with regard to the scripture, the sub subjects that the scripture deals with at large. So, what were some of those subjects? Soteriology. What is that? Yes, soteriology from the word soteria, which means to be rescued. You're in peril, rescued. What else? Christology. Christology. What's that the subject of? Jesus Christ. Yeah, what else? Pneumatology. What is that? The study of hair tools. <laughs> no, you're right, though. The Holy Spirit, yeah. Pneuma, air, right? Pneumatic tools. No, no but what's that? what else? Theology, God proper. Bibliology, the Bible. What? Angelology. Demonology. <laughs> that's the one that's missing. Because every time you've heard me use the word, it's been most often when I've talked about Donald, uh, Dr. Arnold Frunkenbaum. He's a Messianic Jew. He wrote a volume called Israelology, the Missing Link in Systematic Theology. Most systematic theologies, the number of them that I have on my shelf at home, I pull them off my shelf, there's no Israelology. Is Israel not a major subject of the scriptures? Yes. How many times is Jerusalem mentioned in scripture? A lot. <laughs> a lot. Over 600 times, the city of Jerusalem. Aside from Christ, Christ number one, second to that, Israel. God's whole redemptive plan, when we go to Genesis 3.15, where he, he began the whole series of the whole Bible from Genesis 3.15 all the way to Revelation 22.21, is God's plan of redemption from the world. And how does he work that redemption? Through the Jewish people, through Israel. Hmm. But last time we were together, we talked about eschatology, and we said it's the study of all things, and why should we study it? Because eschatology is a major part of the Bible narrative, or our worldview. We, we referenced Amos 3.7. You can look at your hand on okay? <laughs> Secondly, we said it's to preach and heed the whole counsel of God, as Paul would say in Acts 20.27. 20, Everyone is interested in the future. That's why we're all here tonight, right? I want to know what God has to say about the future, but I want to know it accurately. Hmm? Eschatology is a motivation for believers. Eschatology has a purifying effect on a believer. Of course it does, doesn't it? If you believe that Jesus Christ could come tonight, is that going to have an effect on your behavior? There are things you don't want to get caught doing tonight when Jesus comes. There are legitimate things I don't want to be caught doing when Gail comes downstairs and sees me with a bowl of ice cream. You know? <laughs> Eschatology gives perspective to the troubles and the trials of this age, doesn't it? Yeah, what did you say? Do you not have that? 
Oh, do we have another one of these, John Michael? I'm sharing with Amy. You're sharing with Amy? I'll share. Yeah, I'll share with you. <laughs> Eschatology warns the unbeliever of the coming judgment. As the Holy Spirit has taught us how to witness. How do we witness to people? Just as he does, the Holy Spirit has come to convict of Sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's exactly how we witness the people. We got to get them lost before you can get them saved, right? And you got to get them to understand you can't win acceptance before God by your works. Impossible. It's by the finished work of Jesus Christ, by his blood upon the cross. He paid for our sin, the punishment that was due us, right? His righteousness. And then if you refuse, if you refuse the witness of the Holy Spirit with regard to the person of Jesus Christ, you are damned forever. That's the judgment. Nobody wants to talk about that today. So many of the contemporary pastors, you know, in these big mega churches, everybody goes to heaven, don't they? That's all you got to do. <laughs> How many Catholics we got here? Ex-Catholic. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me, in, in, a, in a technical sense of the word, how many Catholics do we have here? You're all Catholics. What does Catholic mean? Universal. Universal church. That's all it means. Now, how many were you brought up in Roman Catholicism? Romanism, yeah. And you had to obey all the sacraments of the church. Sometimes there were as many as 30 sacraments, depending upon which pope was in office. And if you obeyed those sacraments, you had a hope, a maybe. Oh, but then again, you know, the moment the coin in the kettle rings, your loved one from Purgatory Springs... They can buy your way out of heaven. I mean, out of hell. <laughs> Nonsense, right? There's a judgment coming. Make no mistake about it. We have become the most irreligious. We are in a moral free fall in the society in which we live. And God has to judge, doesn't he? Yeah. All right. So we talked about biblical hermeneutics. What was that? Son? Right, the method by which you interpret the scriptures, okay? It says right here, I got a definition there. It says the study method that deals with the interpretation, especially of biblical text, especially of the establishment of the principles by which things are interpreted. So we as dispensationalists, we take the word of God how? What way? How do we view the word of God? Literally, Literally right? We believe that, that the Bible is God-breathed. We call that? Inspired, inspiration, the inspiration of the scripture by the Holy Spirit of God. We believe that the Bible is not only inspired, it is infallible. infallible. What does that mean? The infallibility of the scripture means that in everything it intends to teach you, doesn't matter what it is, what field of, of discipline or study, it's accurate in everything it teaches, every precept, right? It gives you the good, the bad, the ugly, right? The, <clears throat> there are many things in the Bible that are not prescriptive, they're just descriptive. Like what? Multiple marriages, polygamy. God isn't, God isn't endorsing polygamy, is he? No, no. From the very beginning, when God established marriage, he established one biological man, right? One biological man for one biological woman until death do them part. Hmm? That's marriage from God's perspective. When he describes a man being married to multiple wives, he's just describing the situation. He's not being prescriptive. He should not do that, right? So it's infallible. It is Inerrant in the original language, whether it's the Hebrew or Aramaic of the Old Testament or the Greek of the New Testament, there are no errors in the original manuscripts. Are there errors in the translations? Yes, yes. When's the last time you saw a unicorn? What's a unicorn? A unicorn is a mythical beast. Do they exist? Is there such a thing as a unicorn? No, no. They, the king's name translators, they did a fantastic job for what they had. In the original King James, okay, 1611, King James gathered together all of these scholars, and they had about 300 manuscripts, Hebrew Old Testament manuscripts, from which to work to try to interpret what these Hebrew words meant. So when they got to the word for an ox, they didn't know what it meant. And for some reason, they thought it was a unicorn. There's no such thing as a unicorn, but that's what you have in the King James Bible, a unicorn. Now we know we have over 3,000 manuscripts, and some of them much older than they had to use. And so we know it's not a unicorn, it's an ox. Ox. So, in the original language, it is without error. So it is inspired, it is infallible, it is in error. Therefore, it is what? Do you believe that? Oh, I hope so. 
more and more and more of the church no longer believes that the Bible has the authority in governing over your life and what you to believe and what you to practice. The pastor of the largest church in Georgia had the, Georgia had the opportunity to speak before the Georgia legis- legislature the other day. Did you see that? I would wish for an opportunity to speak to the South Carolina legislators. What do you think I'd tell these legislators? <laughs> I'd say, you're a bunch of politicians. And you know what politics are? Poly many ticks, blood sucking creatures. <laughs> and you need to change your ways or judgment will fall upon you. Right? Now that, that we should present the gospel, right? He didn't do that. Why didn't he do that? Because he doesn't believe the Bible any longer. Who's that pastor? The largest church in Georgia, state of Georgia? Andy Stan. Andy Stan. What, did, what did he say? First of all, he said a few months ago, you got to unhitch the Old Testament from the New. How insane is that? I, can't, I really can't get a full understanding and the, and the importance in the New Testament unless I have some understanding of the Jewishness of the Old Testament. And the Old Testament gives me greater understanding in some of the new nuances in the New Testament. But most recently, what did he say? Your Christianity is not dependent upon 66 ancient documents. That's not what your Christianity is dependent upon. Your Christianity is dependent upon your personal experience with the mystical Christ. So just go home tonight and sit and stare at your navel. Um, and clear your mind. Most people would do that in my list already. And then, and then whatever Christ would appear, male, female, young, old, makes no difference. That's your truth. That's your re- Is that true? No, but that, listen, you don't know, you have no understanding how... We call that progressive Christianity. Anybody know about progressive Christianity? Get on YouTube and start exploring what these people believe who embrace progressive Christianity. They completely discount the scriptures. It's all about your experience and how I feel. Hmm. No, our interpretive principles or method by which we... Interpret the scriptures is called hermeneutics. Now, within your hermeneutic, you're going to have a bias one way or another, right? Everybody has a bias. Hmm? You know, as a Christian, I love everybody, don't you? But because of my bias, there's some people I like a lot more, right? (laughs) It's my fleshly bias. But I love everybody. But there's just some people I like more, you know? Well, we even have a bias when it comes to our hermeneutic, okay? And, and I presented it very simply. There's two biases generally. What are they? Dispensationalism. Dispensationalism. Look, at, it's right here on your paper. I'm not asking you anything I don't want you to know. Okay. <laughs> it's dispensational theology versus covenant theology. All right, dispensational theology, the biblical exegesis, you are allowing the text to lead out. You let the text speak for itself. And when you're doing that interpretation of the text in an exegetical, dispensational, expositional fashion, what is king? Context. Context. Context is king. What were the verses before, the verses after, the chapters before, the chapters after? What is the book trying to say as a whole? And you keep it within its literary, historical, grammatical context. Very important, very important, okay? In in dispensational theology, we believe that there's an actual kingdom of God, and who's who's going to be the residents or the citizens of the kingdom of God from that perspective versus the kingdom of heaven, the Jews. You got to understand when, when the Bible talks about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, there's five different meanings. And I think we've went through that before. Hmm? You remember some of them? Sure you do. The mystery kingdom, Matthew chapter 12, all the parables of the mystery kingdom. The theocratic kingdom, Old Testament, under Moses, where God was governing through his delegated authority. Millennial kingdom. kingdom. What is that? The millennial kingdom? Where does it get that word millennium? A thousand. From where? From the Greek text, the Greek word for 
millennium for a thousand years is millennium. That's why we call it the millennial reign of Christ, a thousand year Christ, a thousand year kingdom. So there are at least five, five different understandings when you come to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and you want to make sure you know which one we're talking about, right? Hmm. There is a difference in the kingdom of God, which refers to the Jews and a kingdom here on earth and the kingdom of heaven, which is the church, both Jew and Gentile, which is spiritual. Does God not have a distinct and unique plan for Israel as well as for the church? Or are the two one and the same? They're very distinct. Now, that's what separates what we believe and what a covenant theologian or those who embrace covenant theology believe. It's all, the hinge point on that is all in what you believe about Israel. Why is there no Israelology in a systematic theology? And why do they think that? They think the church has replaced Israel. It's called replacement theology. That God was done with Israel and now he's working predominantly in the church since Pentecost. Why do they think that? Because they rejected Christ. Were they alone rejected Christ? No, but because of the anti-Semitism that, that sprang up in the early church. They were the Christ killers. Hmm? Where, does covenant, where did covenant theology begin? Augustine. With Augustine and Roman Catholicism. In the Catholic covenant, listen to me, covenant theology, look down here. Covenant theology is that one kingdom, one people of God, one plan, that's called replacement theology, that God has done with the Jews, and now he's working with the, with the church. They're Eisegesis versus exegesis. Exegesis is you're allowing the text to speak for itself. You bring out what the text has to say. Eisegesis, I have a predetermined presupposition, and I'm looking for what I'm looking for, and I'm going to make sure it's there, right? So what does that mean? I'm putting something into the text that may not be there at all, because how am I interpreting it? I'm not interpreting it literally. How am I interpreting it? allegorically. It's just a story. And who determines what that story is? Hmm. Boy, does that become a problem? In dispensational theology, we take a literal meaning of the text and we use what is called inductive Bible study method, which is observation, interpretation, application. Okay? Observation, observe the text. What is the text saying? Who's speaking to whom? About what? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you try to interpret the text. How many technical, listen to me now, listen closely. How many technical interpretations are there of every single biblical text? If you ask most people out there in the world, what would they say? It's not true, is it? No. Now, once you seek to find the technical interpretation of the text, you can look at the text allegorically, metaphorically. I mean, you can, you know, you can apply it to your own life, right? Eisegesis, their allegorical method, uses imagination, exploration, application. <laughs> You've got to be very careful when you try to use your imagination to determine what the text has to say. That's like arguing science and the Bible. The Bible is God's... You see, that's another thing I've told you many times. The Bible is God's revelation. God is revealing truth. The Bible brings out the truth of God, right? The Bible is God's revelation. Science is man's speculation. Now, now much of science is true. But have we had to change a lot of our scientific positions and theories over the years? We found out the earth isn't flat. It's just as Isaiah said, it's a sphere, right? I mean, and many, many, many more. And now we don't, we don't even know what a woman is today. God told us what a woman is. We don't. <laughs> but I know Snickers is a dog and I'm not a veterinarian. Now, I want to... I wanna, I'm not in a hurry when we go through this study, so I, I prepared a lot more than what I'm going to give you tonight. So we'll continue on next week. But I, th I thought I would show you an example. Now, now, let me preface what you're going to see here. I love and respect a lot of folks in the church who have a differing opinion than I do when it comes to interpreting end times prophecy or, or uh, the prophet, prophetic word, uh, the millennial reign, uh, the rapture, etc., etc. I, I have a disagreement when it comes to eschatology with covenant theologians. 
but I am in complete agreement with him when it comes to my soteriology, right? My soteriology is monogistic. What does that mean? God did it all. It's not synergistic. It wasn't me working with God, then it puts the credit on me, right? I was so smart, so willing, so, you know, no, 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 no. So I realized that soteriology, I'm more reformed in that area, but I'm not a reformer, I'm not a dispensationalist. You know what I call myself? A biblicist. Or maybe I'm a reformed dispensationalist. Or maybe I'm a dispensational reformer. I don't know, I don't know, but I believe the Bible, you know? And, and I don't want to come with a preconceived notion a predetermined position. I want to let the Bible speak for itself. Now, that's the difference. That's the major difference between dispensational theology, covenant theology, dispensational theology, the word leads out. Covenant theology, you lead into the word, which you want to see there. One takes the text literally wherever possible. Now, there are places where you can't take the Bible literally, right? You have to understand its figurative meaning. There are, uh, but the covenant theologian will interpret the scriptures allegorically. They want it to present their story that they're looking at. And we'll get deeper into that as we look at millennialism. But last book we studied was what? And the last chapter of Daniel we studied was what? The last chapter was 12. Thank you. <laughs> it's only 12 chapters in Daniel. The last book we studied, and the last chapter was chapter 12. Now, you should be, it wasn't that far, well, it was a couple of weeks ago, wasn't it? I, I believe in you. I believe in you. Lord, I believe in these people. Lord, I'm going to show you two clips. This is, this is Vody Bachman. Now, do you know Vody Bachman? Anybody know Vody Bachman? Vody Bachman has a lot of wonderful things to say. He's, he's, he's a far more gifted, far more educated, greater man than I am, okay? So please, I'm not trying to disparage Vody Bachman. We're talking about the difference between an allegorical interpretation and a literal ter interpretation of the text. I want you to listen to his interpretation of portions of chapter 12, and you tell me what's wrong with it, okay? So listen, listen clearly, listen carefully, listen critically. In addition to this encouraging presence of angelic beings, we also have the discouraging reality of persecution. We see that in chapter, uh, in verse 1 and also in verse 7. Look at verse 1 again. At that time shall rise Michael, the great prince of, uh, who was in charge of his people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. Go down with me in verse 7 and look at verse 7. And I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters and the streams. He raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for time, times, and half a time. And that when, listen to this, the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end. The shattering of the power of the holy people. He said it again and again and again and in multiple ways that at the end of the age there would be great persecution of the people of God at the end of the age. L let, me, let me tell you this, brothers and sisters. The church will not escape tribulation. The church has not escaped tribulation. The church is in the midst of tribulation. And again, this flies in the face of what we hear so often. We have all just been inundated with dispensational premillennialism. And all of us, I mean, we're just washed in it and bathed in it. I, I, I'll never forget my first interview that I had to interview for a church position. I was a young seminarian. I was going through this interview for a church position. And I was actually asked... You know, if, if I believed in a pre-tribulation rapture. And everybody in the room knew that if I said I did not believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, and at that time I did because I didn't know that there was anybody who was a real Christian who didn't believe in a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. And so I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> church ain't going to go through no tribulation, man. We're going to be out of here. We're going to be raptured. We're gone. Of course I believe in that. I guess I didn't pay attention to Daniel chapter 12. 
Watch this. Look at what he says. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name shall be found written in the book of the life. Written in the book of life. And then we have the general re resurrection. After this tremendous persecution. Here's the other thing. It's going on now. The only thing we find at the end of the age is just that it has continued to intensify. There is no secret rapture of the church before the great tribulation. It's just not there. There are no multiple raptures. It's just not there. The calling up of the dead at the end of the age is just that. It's the end of the age. It's one event, one fell swoop, bam, Christ comes and it's over. Give me a break. Jesus is going to return for a thousand years and there's going to be a new temple where there are sacrifices being made to him while he's ruling on the earth and he's going to allow that blasphemy to go on? Help you if you believe that. That's blasphemy. Here's Jesus who is the Lamb of God, who was slain for the sins of the people of God. And you're going to put a lamb or a goat on an altar and kill that lamb or that goat while the Lamb of God is ruling and reigning? No. Absolutely not. And that is all presuppositional. All of it. Every last bit of it not what the scriptures clearly teach. But the good news is that God preserves his people in the midst of it. There's also this picture of the inevitability of the general resurrection and the judgment. Verses 2, 10, and 13. We already looked at verse 2. Look at it again. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Notice this, okay? Because the secret rapture, the secret pre-trib rapture, is so, it, basically what that's supposed to mean is that God's people are going to be raptured and they're going to be taken out of here secretly, okay? And, and, and everybody else is going to be looking around going, you know, what happened to them? Here's a general resurrection that happens at the end of the age for everybody. Look at verse 10. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined, but the wicked shall act wickedly. Verse 13. Go your way to the end and you shall rest. I believe that's a reference to the fact that Daniel's going to die and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of the days. That's a reference to him being resurrected. But when? At the end of the days. At the end. 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 Hebrews chapter 9 in verse 27, verse 26 through 28. Just as it is appointed to man to die once, and after that comes the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Well, he appears a second time, not a second and a third. It says he appears a second time. Again, look at it again. Every man will die. And then he will face the judgment. And then right after that, Christ is going to appear a second time. For what? For the judgment, not for a secret rapture. For the judgment. Listen to this. One of the passages that is often used to refer to this idea of a secret rapture of the church. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. I'm going to read. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those. By the way, I heard this passage preached not long ago. 
And the pastor took this. This was his text. And he was preaching the whole idea of, you know, dispensational premillennialism and the secret rapture of the church and, you know, and then, uh, you know, all this sort of stuff. He, this, was, this, was his, this was his text. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, who are left until the coming of the Lord, who are left until the coming of the Lord, this is when he comes at the end of the age, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel. Does that sound like a secret? And with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Where do you get a secret rapture from that passage of Scripture? It's not there. That's the end of the age. One fell swoop, one event. But first of all, going back to Daniel, did you, did you notice where he, where he started to choke in verse 1? At that time, Michael shall stand up, that great prince who stands watch over the sons of? Over the sons of? Uh, your, who, who is the angel referring to when he's talking with Daniel? Is he referring to Gentiles and the church? No, he's referring to Israel. It's replacement theology. He completely discounts any future plan that God would have for the nation of Israel, although it's replete in the scriptures. And those who would be going through the suffering that he was referring to is not the church, it's not Gentiles, it's the Jewish people. When the Jewish people are revived spiritually, there'll be a time of trouble such as the world has never seen before, nor will ever see again, but that's to the Jewish people. You understand that? Now go to Revelation chapter 20 for a minute. And we'll spend more time in there next week, but <clears throat> Revelation 20. There, there are uh, basically four different interpretive positions or views upon the millennial millennialism or the millennial reign that's spoken of here a thousand years. Do you know what they are? No, what, what, no, there's, no, those are the interpretations, interpretation view of revelation itself, but of millennialism. What, what do we call those? Post millennialism, pre millennialism, right? And then dispensational pre millennialism. Did you get a handout? Is it on your handout? Did I put it on your handout? Yeah? And what's the fourth one? Oh, millennialism. Oh, millennialism. Okay? And then, and, then there are, and then there are those four interpretive styles with regard to the book of Revelation. So you need to understand that. Every, everybody comes with a different bias. But God gave clarity in the way in which we need to see Israel in the scriptures when he said to Abraham, who would be the father of the Jewish nation, right? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the 12 tribes. He said, I will bless those. I will curse those. I think God has given us such a blessing in this particular time of the church age in that there are so many messianic Jews that have come to faith that have really helped open up our eyes and our understanding to the role Israel plays within Scripture. 
for hundreds of years, no serious theologian believed that Israel would ever come back to life as a nation, right? Anybody ever hear of Clarence Larkin? I'm sorry? Oh, he did a slew of, I got his book. I bought his book several years ago. I was reviewing and getting in this morning. I mean, he's just, he's so detailed. When did he write that? 1908, first publication. 1908. Uh, if you really want to understand dispensational theology, get Clarence Larkin's book and all of the charts. And I mean, but it is very detailed. So you really got to, you know, have a uh, more of an engineering analytical kind of a mind. But it's really fascinating. Okay. But when did Israel become a nation? And he, he clearly, as, as a minority view, clearly believes Israel is going to be back in the land again. And that the nation of Israel is going to be revived. He was mocked for that. Se severely and unfortunately that's the problem today there is such an anti-semitic attitude even among people who believe you know um, we talked about augustine augustine had more influence on the church than any other man save the apostle paul do you understand that what was his attitude towards the jew he was an anti-semite they were the christ killers martin luther the father of the reformation right what was his attitude towards the Jew? If, if a Jew won't convert, he's only good for the flames. Burn him at the stake. Can you imagine? <laughs> God used these men. But what do we know about men? The best of men are men at best. None of us have it, but all together. And please, you need to understand that. So don't make sure your expert is your expert. And there's only one expert when it comes to the word of God. And who's that? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. But at this time, the Holy Spirit has given us such deeper understanding into God's future plan for Israel and the church, but they're independent of one another, you see. And that's what Vo Vodi is missing because of his bias against the Jews and his replacement theology. He's already approaching the scriptures, believing that God's done with Israel. And so the only thing you can see in the text is the church. So that's what he reads into the text. He reads in the text, the church, the church, the church, when it's not speaking about the church at all. The church isn't in existence yet, right? And he's clearly speaking about Israel. But when he talks about there's only one resurrection, and you know, I would never say that vote is blasphemous. I wouldn't. I, I'd say he misunderstands because of a bias that he has, and maybe his bias is not good, but it's not blasphemous. I mean, but they, cons they consider us, a hyper-covenant theologian, considers us lost. We're not even saved as far as they're concerned. The extreme example of that would be who? What, where did covenant theology begin? Where? The Catholic Church. <clears throat> Do you understand, and Catholic doctrine... Vatican I, Vatican II, makes no difference, okay? In Catholic doctrine, we are, we are ever Catholic, Mike? Yeah. We are ever Catholic? Altar yeah. Boy. Altar boy. All right. <laughs> yeah, would you become a Eucharistic minister too? Is no, you, the expecting priest. Oh, yeah, and the priesthood. Yeah. yeah. Now, the only way we can have salvation or any hope of salvation, not the assurance of salvation, is by participating in something that the Catholic Church alone can do. What is that? Eucharist. The Eucharist transubstantiation, covenant theology, right? Anybody outside of them is damned. They won't allow for another alternate opinion, right? But they believe that anybody who does not participate in the mass, which the, when you speak of the mass in their terms, they're talking about transubstantiation where they perform the Eucharistic miracle. They take the wine and turn it into his blood. They take the host and turn it into his body and they re-crucify Christ over and over and over and over contrary to scripture. Yet it's interesting that they were the ones who first got this ball rolling on anti-Semitism among the Gentile world. It's a, it's a demonic doctrine for sure, isn't it? Look at Revelation 20. Talk about the first and the second resurrection. Uh, let's look at uh, 
We talk about the angel came down from heaven, having a key to the bottomless pit, to the abuso, and a chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, the old serpent of old, who was the devil and Satan, one and the same, right? Just different names. And bound him for? How long? <laughs> he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should not deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. How many? Okay, yeah. But after these things, he must be released for a short while. So the text is telling us, literally, the text is telling us that there's an angel coming down from heaven. Who do you think that angel is? Michael, Michael. yeah. Michael. Michael's coming down. He's going to lay hold of Satan. Now, where's Satan right now? Before the throne of God. Very soon, where's he going to be? When God body slams him to the earth, he knows he's got by a short time. And he's going to get up with a rage against the Jews and the remnants of the church that's here, right? Mm. But at the end of the tribulation period, at the beginning of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, Michael grabs hold of that devil, the dragon, that serpent of old, and he casts him into the bottomless pit and puts a seal on it. I think he probably sits on it. What do you think? <laughs> you ain't going nowhere, buddy, till I let you out. <laughs> thousand years. And at the end of the thousand years, what's going to happen? Amazingly, at the end of the... Now, why has that got to happen? Why? Right. That's right. That's right. See, see, the rapture has occurred. The rapture is that first resurrection. It's the resurrection of the faithful dead, and, and it's the translation of those who are alive and remain. Boom. We're all translated. We all get our glorified bodies. We're not in our flesh and blood bodies anymore. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Right? Not in this body of sin. Hmm. Now... <clears throat> during the thousand years, the earth is going to be repopulated again. Who's repopulating the earth predominantly? Jews. Jews. And they're going to be doing that for a thousand years. And my sister called me the other day. She said, I'm going to show you the picture. I'm going to text you a picture of my ninth great-grandchild. I said, you're producing like rabbits up there. What's going on? <laughs> Must be in the water. <laughs> ninth great-grandchild, you know? <laughs> Amazing. But anyway, that's what's going to happen when... Christ is reigning upon the earth. There'll be an agrarian, an agricultural society once again, and there'll be big families and lots of kids, and oh boy, I wish I could be living at that time. But and again, I'll be happy, I'll be into my translated body. But there will be those born in their flesh and blood bodies who have a choice, right? Hmm? They'll, have they'll have that old sin nature. And at the end of the thousand years, God's got to do a separation again between the wheat and the tares, between the sheep and the goats, between the believers and the unbelievers, and that's why Satan's going to be released to lead a rebellion one more time, and that'll be the end of it, thank God. And that's what he's talking about here. Cast him in the bottom of the spin till the thousand years are finished. But after these things, he must release him for a little while. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the witness of Jesus Christ and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and not received the mark upon their foreheads or upon their heads. And they lived and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Praise God. These people came through the tribulation period. They're called tribulation Right? There's only three types of saints in the Bible, right? There's Old Testament saints, there's New Testament saints, and there's... And that's all there is, right? So these are tribulation saints. They go through the tribulation. And they lived and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead were not alive again until the thousand years were finished. For this is the first resurrection. What's the first resurrection? The rapture. The rapture was the first resurrection. But the unrighteous dead, the unbelieving dead, they haven't been resurrected yet. Where are they? They're in Hades or Sheol. Mankind's common grave, but they're in a place of torment, right? This is the first resurrection. <clears throat> verse 8, verse 7. Now when the thousand years were expired, Satan was released from his prison. Oh, wait a minute. Let me go back to verse 6. Let me go back to verse 5. But the rest of the dead did not live again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests and of God and of his Christ and shall reign with him for a thousand years. The second death, right? Why? Because if you're born twice, you die. If you're born once, you die. And that's what they're talking about here. Now, the second resurrection is the second death of those who, did un who un were unbelieving. Verse 7. 
Now when the thousand years are expired, Satan will be released from his prison. He will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. Is this a literal Gog and Magog as in Ezekiel 38 and 39? No, No, this is a figurative Gog and Magog. Gog and Magog are the enemies of God's people. And particularly when we get into Ezekiel and we look at the end time scenario, what's going to take place before the tribulation period, there's this battle that takes place between the Jews and those who are invading their land. And it's the principal invaders are the Megagites, and their leader is Gog. Who are the Megagites? Ancient Scythians. Ancient Scythians are the present-day Ruskis, right? And who's with them? Iran, Iran, the Iranians. Who else? Turkey, Turkey. yeah. And all all these states that are enemies of the state of Israel, even right now, are going to be coming against them. There was a piece I was reading the other day about, uh, could it be possible that Israel's gas reserves will cause Israel... That to be uh, will cause Russia to strike Israel? Yeah, that's a good possibility. Okay, but this Gog and Magog is not figurative, it's literal, but they are enemies of God and his people, just as the Gog Magog invasion were enemies of God's people Israel. Here they're enemies of God's people Israel once again and the church. Gog and Magog to gather them together to battle, whose number is as of the sand of the sea a worldwide war. And now most of the inhabitants that were reborn into this world, what are they doing? They're a rebellion of God. Why? Because we're all sinners. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We would never come to God unless God began work in our life, right? For by grace you have been saved through faith that not of your own but a gift of God, not of works, least any man should boast. The charismata, the grace gift of faith, bestowal to believe was given to us by God so we could see. Yes, the devil. Let's see. Uh, There was numerous as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. Where's this? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Israel. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever and ever. Hallelujah. Right? Now, when did the Antichrist and the false prophet go there? A thousand years before then, the end of the tribulation. The end of the tribulation, the Pope, (laughs) I get myself in trouble here. There's a lot of people who believe, and I I particularly am one of them, that believe that the Pope is going to be the false prophet. And and there's a lot of... uh, Mystics in times past, so we read the Bible, but it's interesting, a lot of these mystics from times past, Catholic mystics believe that this Pope is the last Pope. Did you know that? Isn't that interesting? Google that. Read about that. But nonetheless, the false prophet, whoever he is, okay, he's, he's the Antichrist PR person. He's the one who's leading the one world religious system, right? He's leading that one world religious system and he's getting all of the world to bow down and worship before the image of the beast, of the Antichrist. Now, the Antichrist is not the devil, but he's possessed of the devil, right? But at the end of the tribulation period when Christ returns, and we'll cover all this, the Antichrist and the false prophet are cast into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is Gehana, eternal damnation. Sheol or Hades is a temporary holding period for the unbelieving dead. But the lake of fire, or Gehana, is that permanent place of damnation. Now, at the end, now, during the beginning of the thousand years, Satan was put down into this hole. Michael put a cap on it, and he sat on it. At the end of the thousand years, he opens it up, and what does Satan do? Isn't it insane how people resist the goodness of God? How people resist the beauty that God wants to work into their life, into their relationships, I was watching a documentary because we have a loved one who's uh, in Kentucky and it was this redneck rave. Anybody ever hear this redneck rave? It sounds just unbelievable to me. Disney. Disney is upset because the state of Florida won't allow grade school children to be put into gender confusion. Why would anybody, why would we want to, 
in elementary school, what are they supposed to be learning? Math, Math right? Reading, arithmetic, science, and playtime. Oh, all the sexually explicit. Yes. It's terrible, it's terrible, terrible, terrible. We're such a crest. So why, why, why? It's demonic. Verse 11, chapter 20. And then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it and those whose, fa who, and those whose face, the earth and the heaven, had fled away. And from there was found no place for them. I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead who were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and Hades, death and Hades, mankind's common grave, this temporary holding place, delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were all judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire, and this is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, there is a time period between the first and second resurrection, right? What's that time period? If you're going to understand the text literally, right? Now, if you want to allegorize the text and you want to say something other than you have to really massage the text. I mean, you have to... If you torture any biblical text long enough, it'll confess anything. Right? <laughs> You understand what I'm saying? Because that's, that's exactly what they're doing here. Do we have time for one more? Anybody in a big hurry? If you're in a hurry, you can go. We've got one more we're going to... You know, it's just important that you know these things, you know? We've got one more I want to show you here. From the book of Daniel once again, and you're going to see the difference between a literal interpretation, this is speaking of the nation of Israel, and an allegorical interpretation. We get this last part here. Verse 11, out of nowhere. And from the time that the regular burnt offerings is taken away and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who wakes and arrives at the 1,335 days. Huh? Well, we know that we see that number 1,260 days, which is right at three and a half years, um, there is a, the solar rendering of time that they had, which was 364 days, and the lunar rendering of time that they had, which made a year, 354 days. Their solar lunar sort of rendering that made it right at 360 days. And 360 days, you're right there smack dab in the middle at 1260 days. But this goes beyond any of those to 1,290 days. So it's a little beyond the three and a half years. And then there's another number, which is 45 days later. Several possibilities. One is that we turn back and we talked about Antiochus again, because we know that the work of Antiochus against the people of God lasted right about three and a half years. And then it was a little over a month later after God's people were delivered from Antiochus, it's only about a month and a half later that he dies. But this is pointing forward. I believe even beyond that. I believe this is one of those prophecies that has multiple fulfillments. We see this in Antiochus. Yeah, we see this in Antiochus. But Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 refers back to this prophecy again, talking about the end of the age. I believe we saw this in AD 70 as well with the destruction of the temple. I believe we saw that. But it also points to the same ultimate reality. What's that ultimate reality? The ultimate reality is this, that there are those who oppress the people of God, sometimes manifest in individuals who do so in a very public way. But even that is cut short. Because there is no man who can oppress the people of God. And ultimately, he will meet his end. And I love it because in the very next verse, we get the so what. Because we're left with that verse right there, you know, verses 11 and 12, scratching our heads going, what is that? 
who is that? Could be this, could be that. Probably a combination of this and that and something else. Okay, so what do we do with that? Verse 13, go your way till the end. You shall rest and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of the days. That's not just for Daniel. That's for you and me. What do I do with this? Go your way until the end. Do what God's called you to do. Be what God's called you to be. And then you're going to rest. You're going to die. But that's okay. Because even death won't stop you from standing in your allotted place at the end of the age. Where's your allotted place? With Christ. So what's the 1290 and the 1335? Whatever it is, it's somebody who meets their end. And they don't get to stand where I stand. They'll stand for a while. But their standing and my standing are two entirely different standings. Because I stand with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I stand with Christ himself. I don't know what you are going to be called to endure. But I do know this. In this life you shall have trouble. I know that all those who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus shall be persecuted. And I know that whether you and I are alive at the end of the age when these things have intensified or whether we die a thousand years ahead of that, we are going to experience trials, tribulation, persecution, heartache, and difficulty. We are going to see men who mock God, who terrorize the people of God. And we're going to ask ourselves when we see this, God, how long are you going to allow this man to do what he's doing and say what he's saying before you do something about it? And when you get to that place and just before you kind of lose yourself and shake your fist at God, remember what he says to Daniel. I'm in control. I'll deal with that. You just go your way until the end. And then you just rest until my angels call you. And then you'll stand in your allotted place because of Christ who died in your allotted place. And trust me, there will be no one at that time making a mockery of God or his people. It's me, you know. But what's wrong with what he said? I can't hear you. No, he actually got one thing right. We will stand with Christ. Amen, we will. Now listen, listen. Bodhi, Bodhi. He loves the Lord. He loves the word of God. I'm not speaking, I'm not disparaging the man at all. But his, his approach at interpreting end time scripture or apocalyptic literature is skewed because of that anti-Israel bias in covenant theology. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. Do I think it separates the church? Yeah. Now, on the essentials, Tyler, Tyler, or on the essentials, we have to agree. On the non-essentials like this, we're open for interpretation. Yeah, I mean, just like the word eschatology and all these isms and all this stuff, don't you think over time, dispositionism, covenantism, all that is what has divided the church over the time of the years? No, 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 no. It, It should sharpen the church. We, should, we need to be workers who show ourselves approved of God. See, the reason why the church is in the terrible shape it's in, in the West, no, 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 because we're ignorant. Yeah. We're ignorant. My people perish. Why? 
lack of knowledge. They, they don't understand. Now, I understand, I agree with Vody on the essentials of the faith. There's no disagreement whatsoever. We're brothers, okay? We disagree here, that's all. But where does that disagreement have its source? And its attitude towards Israel. We need to love the Jewish people. God sacrificed two sons, in a sense. Now, only the sacrifice of Jesus saves you, period. But the national rejection of Jesus, the Messiah, by Israel, was for the purpose of the salvation of? He purposed that. In Romans, it tells us he predetermined that. He predestined the rejection of the Messiah by his own people for the sake of your salvation and mine. So therefore, as Paul said, we have such a great debt of love that we owe the Jewish people. Not to be biased against them. Hmm? Uh, I guess enough said right now. But you, you understand? I hope you understood the differences there between what he was saying there. Now, Putin is not the abomination of desolation. Vladimir Putin. Antiochus Epiphanes was not the abomination of desolation. He was a type. Okay, there is the Antichrist who is coming. But John would say in First John and Epistle, there are many, and that's true too. There are many who possess the spirit of Antichrist, but there's only one Antichrist, right? And there is only one who is going to be called the abomination of desolation. Jesus references him, and where does he create that abomination? In the temple, in the temple of God. And in in the, he goes into the Holy of Holies of the rebuilt temple, and he does exactly what Nebuchadnezzar did in Daniel chapter 2, where he wants the whole world to bow down and worship him. Hmm? And so Antichrist will do exactly that, of which Nebuchadnezzar was just a type. Antiochus was just a type. But there is the Antichrist. And who suffers more than anybody else during this time? Israel. Time of suffering such as never been before, nowhere I'll ever be again. Hmm. Now, um, I'm sorry for our young fellows walking out. Maybe they don't understand that it is important that you have a correct understanding of eschatology. The reason why the church is in such pitiful shape that it's in is because it's so ignorant of the Bible they say they believe. Or these, these pretenders, masqueraders, wouldn't get away with the statements that they make and the congregation sits there and laughs. Well, most of those congregations don't have what you have in your lap. What is that? Bible. Bible. Why? Because it's not necessary. They don't study the Bible. But it's an important that we, particularly in these last days, be workers to show ourselves approved of God, rightly dividing the word of truth. Sure. Now you made the comment that this gentleman is saved. Yeah, he's saved. How did Martin Luther hate Israel? How, 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 how did Augustine hate Israel? How did R.C. Sproul hate Israel? We're all sinners. Have you ever hated anybody? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so you think it's, it's, it's acceptable when it's a different object of hatred? <laughs> We're all flawed. We're all flawed, and, and we have to be open to accept whatever correction God wants to make in our life with regard to what we believe about the Scriptures and what He's trying to teach us. And, and uh, I hope and pray that at, at some point, you know, we, I took a bunch of, of you all years ago up to Charlotte to listen to R.C. Sproul because I think no one had a better understanding of the sovereignty of God on, on theology, God proper, and, and salvation, soteriology, and R.C. Sproul. I've read a lot of his books. I've listened to many of his messages. I used to go down to the League of conferences. And so we went, and it was a wonderful Friday, Saturday conference until it came to the question and answer time. And someone asked the question about Israel and Palestine. And oh, my goodness. He went into this hateful diatribe against the Jewish people. And I was just so brokenhearted. But, you know, who has it all together? God. Now, what's most important, listen to me, what's most important, what's absolutely most important, is not so much what's here, but what's here, 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 you know. 
You want to make sure it travels down from your head to your heart because that's where it's important. I love this man. I don't agree with him on his eschatology. I've watched uh, John MacArthur. John MacArthur is where we are in dispensational theology, okay, on his eschatology. R.C. Sproul is on the opposite side. I've watched the two of them debate one another aggressively, but they're friends. They love one another. They have a mutual respect and love for each other. You know, it's a wonderful thing to see when we can disagree lovingly and agreeably, right? But on the essentials, no, no, no contest. Amen? All right, so the handout you had this, uh, this week, what will be used next week? <laughs> Study it. Go home. Bring your questions. I love you guys. Shall we stand? Pastor David, you got a closing song? If you need to leave, I understand. But the rest of you, let's uh, close with a song.